It's been yet another busy week here in Starbase, complete with full stack testing, preparations for future Starship flights, and while it's not quite Halloween yet, we even had a visit from a Starship vehicle from beyond the grave. Plus, we also did a flyover this week, so we'll get to get eyes on everything we can't see from the ground, including a ton of work that's being done on Pad B's flame trench, and what looked to be, maybe, parts of the OLM for Pad B that will go atop that very trench. Howdy, Star fans. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Factor. Let's start off with a progress report on the second pad here in Starbase. As mentioned in the intro, this week we got our first looks at the hardware that we think might make up the orbital launch mount for Pad B. While we don't have official confirmation that these parts will be for a second orbital launch mount, they do kind of look similar to parts for the first one at Pad A. Thanks to our flyover views, we know that these parts ended up at the Sanchez lot. And well, let's just say that this particular location kind of telegraphs that these parts could indeed be for a second orbital launch mount. In the last couple of months, SpaceX has been preparing a very specific area of the Sanchez lot all the way to the west near the ground fabrication building. This area features what appears to be four pedestals and four support structures. This area is where we think SpaceX will begin building up the orbital launch mount for Pad B. And coincidentally, or maybe not, this is exactly the area where these parts have ended up. Right now, there are two prominent theories as to how the orbital launch mount for Pad B is going to look. One in which it's fixed and looks basically the same as Pad A's, except there's a flame trench underneath it and one theory where the orbital launch mount is in fact mobile, so it can be swapped out and replaced while one is being refurbished, so they can just constantly be cycled back and forth. It's a pretty nifty idea. An advantage of having a mobile orbital launch mount would be that SpaceX could have multiple of them and just swap them out after a launch so that they didn't have to wait on pad refurbishment. They could just put a new OLM in, launch it, swap it out for a new one, launch again. It seems like a pretty good idea. Of course, from the few parts that we've seen so far, we can't yet tell which of the two theories is going to be right, but you better believe we'll keep our eyes on the Sanchez lot for any developments. The OLM parts that have arrived do seem to be not as thick as the ones for the first OLM, so perhaps it won't be carrying as many pipes and as much other major hardware. This could make you lean toward the mobile mount theory as a lighter weight mount would be easier to move around, but it could also just be that this part is just being simplified altogether. So which team are you on? Team mobile mount or team fixed mount? Let us know in the comments. Another thing that we saw on the flyover was that there is what appears to be a booster quick disconnect plate in the OLM construction area. This means that SpaceX is about to start, if not already building, the booster quick disconnect for the second orbital launch mount. But guess what? That's not the only quick disconnect structure that SpaceX is building at the Sanchez lot. That's right, I'm talking about the ship quick disconnect arm. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen SpaceX bringing in pieces for a new ship quick disconnect arm. During this flyover, we were able to spot these pieces and the crane that is being used to put them in the right place for assembly. So far, this QD arm looks to be about the same design as the one for the first tower and the one that we've seen built for the Starship Tower at Launch Complex 39A. But remember, these arms come in two pieces, one that's closer to the tower and another that makes up the tip of the arm and houses the actual umbilical connection. The pieces we see here are just for the parts closer to the tower. So we've yet to see any of the other part with the actual ship connections. Also at the Sanchez lot, we've been able to see progress being made on the chopsticks for the second tower. And just like the chopsticks on the first tower, they're being reinforced and upgraded. We can see that the welds have already been cleaned up and there's a ton of reinforcement plates sitting right next to them. This is hopefully good news for Pad B construction because it means that once they get the arms installed on Tower 2, they won't have to go back and do a whole bunch of retrofits and upgrades and modifications, hopefully. Looking around at the mess of parts that are stored at the Sanchez lot, we can see what looks to be cryogenic piping stored basically everywhere. Feel free to disagree with me, but I think it's not a stretch to say that these pipes will end up being used for things like the ship QD arm and the orbital launch mount, both of which need lots of cryogenic piping. Yet another thing we can see at the Sanchez lot is that all of the hardware in the scrapyard has finally begun to be scrapped again. This includes Booster 4's aft section as well, which was actually attached to a crane while we were flying. 
and we can still see a bunch of its engines laying around nearby. Also, you may notice that Ship 32 has moved from its place in the rocket garden to the scrapyard. So who knows? Maybe they're cleaning up this area so that they have room to scrap this ship. All right, before we come here to the launch site and talk about the progress on Pad B, I have to mention what SpaceX is doing to their new parking garage. For some reason, they're adding a whole bunch of metal grating on the outside, and there's a bunch of scaffolding and work going on on it. But I, I, I don't know what they're doing. But either way, it seems like the parking garage is going to look a lot different than we might have expected. Certainly not your average, ordinary, boring parking garage. Eating right, or eating anything at all, can be a real challenge. That's certainly the case for me when I'm running around here in Starbase shooting rockets all day. I'll get really tired and hangry and be wondering, why do I feel so cruddy? only to realize the culprit. I hadn't eaten anything in hours. This video's sponsor, Factor, eliminates this problem for me. And they also eliminate the need for a time-sucking trip to the grocery store by delivering fresh, never frozen meals that are both delicious and nutritious. This means I have more time to spend fixing our SBL cams or shooting photos of a full stack, which of course is huge. Get it? Because the full stack is huge, but the time savings is huge. It's huge. Factor has over 35 meals you can choose from, and they're ready in just two minutes. Plus, you can also level up your meals with the Gourmet Plus options, making your meals even better by adding premium ingredients and meats. The one I'm about to make right now is jerk Jamaica salmon and shrimp, which I already know is going to be so tasty. It's not just meals though. Factor also offers over 45 add-ons to suit your preferences and tastes. They have breakfast items, delicious cold pressed juice, and in this order, I got some delicious cold brew latte plant-based protein shakes with 110 milligrams of caffeine, which let me tell you, has been super helpful lately. So go to factor75.com or click the link in the description and use code NSF50 to get 50% off your first box. I know you're gonna love it. Thanks again to Factor for sponsoring this video. Okay, now let's head to pad B, where we've seen a ton of progress preparing it for its shiny new flame trench. Well, it's not actually gonna be shiny, but you get what I mean, it's new. Since our last Starbase flyover, there have been a whole bunch of sheet piling driven into the ground in the flame trench area in preparation for the excavation that will be needed to create the trench. In this flyover, we can see that the digging has already begun. In fact, we've noticed this digging from our ground-based cameras for the last several days. It all looked to be concentrated in basically one area. As you can see from these aerial views, teams have been digging out the location where we expect the propellant lines to come up out of the ground and into the orbital launch mount. Given the progress we're seeing so far, it seems like these lines would go from the tank farm at the north, then from the back of the tower and side of the tower and south of the OLM. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other big change here in Starbase since our last flyover, and that is, of course, the tower is complete. Yay! I know, I know, we've talked about it a whole bunch on previous Starbase updates, but there's nothing quite like seeing it from the air. Plus, we were treated to a full stack, so with that combination, both Mary and I were able to make some pretty cool images. I've been saying it for a while now, and I'm going to keep saying it until it happens. I cannot wait until we have two full stacks on two pads here in Starbase. In fact, SpaceX mentioned during their Crew-9 launch coverage that they expect to have Pad B operational in early 2025. So hopefully we'll get to see two full stacks on two pads sooner rather than later. Now, even though the tower is complete, there's still a lot of work going on, including on reinforcements to the base of the tower. We're not sure why SpaceX needed to add these, but I'm sure they had a good reason for it. And well, it's always a good idea to have extra structural margin in something as big and important as a launch tower. All right, now let's shift gears from future plans and future hardware and get a blast from the past with Booster 11. This week, Elon posted a picture of a chunk of the aft section of Booster 11 that SpaceX recovered from the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. When I first saw this image, I thought it had to be AI. There's no way it's real, but it turns out I'm an idiot. This very real and very large piece still had a lot of the outer engines of the booster attached and is obviously rusty, full of sand and broken from all of its time at the bottom of the sea. Looking closely, we can see that the piece was clearly cut from the rest of whatever parts of the booster survived, since it's a very clean cut. This could explain why we don't see any center engines in the picture as those are attached to the aft dome of the booster while the outer engines are attached to the bottom ring. And so with its precious flight proven hardware fished out of the sea, we were all eyes on the ship HOS Ridgewind to come back to the port of Brownsville 
with its booty. The ship came in with the pieces under a tarp, but we could clearly see the shape of the engines still attached to the aft of Booster 11. Also, on the deck of the ship, there was what appeared to be two engines sitting apart on their own, which were also wrapped and covered. These two engines appear to still have their shielding on, and this shielding appears to be for the booster's center engines. So it seems like SpaceX did end up recovering some of those center engines off the seafloor after all. With the pieces in port, SpaceX wasted no time and unloaded some of this hardware off the ship and transported it to the Massey outpost. In fact, during our flyover, we were able to spot some of the recovered Booster 11 hardware right there at the Massey outpost. It'll be really interesting to see what SpaceX ends up doing with this hardware. And I have no doubt that they're going to be looking at it, analyzing it, and gathering data for a long time to come. In the time since the ship came back to port and unloaded all of its booty, it has actually gone back out to the recovery zone, presumably to recover more parts of Booster 11. So who knows? Maybe by this time next week, it'll have already come back to the port of Brownsville again with even more booster parts. While we're looking around the Massey outpost, you might notice that Test Tank 16 is still inside the structural test stand. We've yet to see what the outcome of this testing will be, but rest assured we'll keep our eyes on it in the days and weeks ahead. Also at Massey's, since our last flyover, SpaceX has installed three new liquid oxygen tanks at the tank farm. This will allow teams to either load more liquid oxygen on vehicles or maybe even test multiple vehicles at the same time. It's definitely an interesting addition that will surely help SpaceX a lot. Now let's head over to the production site where there's been a lot of work going on on future vehicles for the Starship program. If you watched last week's Starbase update, we talked about the beginning of a new ship being stacked, and that was Ship 34. Both its payload bay section and its nose cone section were rolled into the high bay to be welded together. And well, this week, they were seen welded together as they exited the high bay and went back into the star factory. This is quite different from Ship 33, which had its nose cone and payload bay sections directly rolled to Mega Bay 2 for stacking with all of the other pieces of the vehicle. Given that, we're not sure why SpaceX did this, but we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled for whenever it rolls out again and Ship 34's stacking resumes. By the way, before this part of Ship 34 could be moved into the Star Factory, it had to be lifted off the welding turntable and onto a transport stand. Mary caught some pretty funny footage of workers trying to get it onto the transport stand using some percussive maintenance. Never change, SpaceX. Another ship that saw progress this week was Ship 31. If you remember, Ship 31 completed engine testing at the Massey Outpost and was rolled back to the high bay, presumably for work on its heat shield tiling. And sure enough, the scaffolding has gone back up inside the high bay and workers have resumed working on Ship 31's heat shield. This overhaul would be similar to what SpaceX did to Ship 30 during the months of June and July. Dozens of workers spent almost a month removing heat shield tiles from Ship 30, then replacing them with new and improved ones. SpaceX also added large portions of ablative heat shield underneath the tiles as a backup in case they crack, fall off, or otherwise fail during flight. A very small amount of this work had already been done to Ship 31 during the months of August and September, but nothing like what we saw on Ship 30. Given that, we expected Ship 31 to roll back to the high bay, the return of the scaffolding, and of course, the return of the heat shield work, which is now underway. This week, we also saw a lot more progress on the office building and its connective structure to the Star Factory. If we go even further back to our last flyover, you can see the progress even better. There's been a whole lot more pieces of this structure installed, and the office building now has almost all of its glass windows installed. We can also see the huge size of this complex. In some of the really wide aerial shots, you have to zoom all the way in to see some of the people, and they're so tiny compared to the Star Factory. The sheer scale of everything here at Starbase is truly mind-blowing. This sentiment also applies to the full stack here at Starbase, which we've been gloriously treated to for the last week. Now, teams haven't only used that time for PR and photo ops. No, they've taken advantage of it and done a partial tanking test of the vehicle. This test took place early in the week, and it essentially consisted of going through all of the countdown steps, stepping in the propellant load, and then stopping once partway through it. Presumably, SpaceX uses this kind of testing as a shakedown of the tank farm and all vehicle systems, just as if it was launch day. What we haven't seen yet, though, is a full wet dress rehearsal. This is essentially the same as a partial tanking test, except the vehicle gets fully loaded and the countdown continues almost all the way to engine ignition. Now, SpaceX has done a full wet dress rehearsal before all of the previous Starship flights, so we kind of expect one, but 
At the same time, when they completed this partial tanking test, SpaceX tweeted that the vehicles were ready for Flight 5. Quote, propellant load test and pre-flight checkouts complete ahead of Flight 5. End quote. So does this mean that's the end of testing for the full stack and it's ready to go for flight? Well, we don't know. But you better believe we're going to keep our eyes on road closures, marine safety information bulletins, Boca Chica village evacuations, and all of the other tea leaves that we can read ahead of a potential full wet dress rehearsal of the Flight 5 stack. Right after this full stack test, teams return the OLM work platform, nicknamed the dance floor, to the launch mount. This gives engineers access to the aft end of Super Heavy and also the launch mount clamps and the Raptor quick disconnect umbilicals. Now, I know some of you are probably asking, why the heck is SpaceX doing a full stack propellant load test so far in advance of November when this thing is supposed to launch? And frankly, it's a good question, and I have no idea. Right after the work platform was reinstalled on the OLM, teams removed the scaffolding from the top of the mount, and they also removed the guiding pins that are used for helping lower boosters down into the orbital launch mount. With those pins removed, the only way Booster 12 will be able to come off of the orbital launch mount is either assisted by a crane and a whole bunch of guide ropes like in the olden days, or under its own power. On top of all of that, SpaceX sent the load spreader that's used to lift the hot staging ring back to the production site, which likely means that the ring will now stay until launch. So for now, all signs point to at least Booster 12 staying on the mount all the way until launch, but you never know, SpaceX could change their mind and change their plans at the drop of a hat, basically. As for Ship 30 coming off the top of Booster 12, well, we'll see. By the way, SpaceX also unfurled a giant flag from the top of Tower 1, just like they've done in the past. This was probably for a photo op, but either way, it sure looked cool. America. While major full stack testing appears to be done, at least for now, SpaceX is still doing lots of little tests here and there, things like quick disconnect retraction tests, chopstick movement tests, and actuating the ship's flaps. And so today on Saturday, with the full stack in full show, SpaceX organized a beach cleanup with the local community, and there was a huge turnout. Let's now go to me from the past in the field at the beach cleanup. I'm here at the beach cleanup. The beach is cleaner. That's like one pile of trash bags. There's been a whole bunch of piles of trash bags, but yeah, a whole bunch of people turned out today for the cleanup. Look at that. Look at all that. Heck yeah. I absolutely love to see SpaceX being a good neighbor and engaging with the local community here in Brownsville, especially the school kids. Yes, we need to get to Mars as soon as possible, but we also need to continue to be good stewards of this precious gem of a planet that we have right now. I gotta say, I really do hope the full stack sticks around all the way until the November launch date. It's just so gorgeous. And yes, I know they're going to have to destack it for FTS install, you get what I mean. Don't forget to go to factor75.com or click the link in the description and use code NSF50 to get 50% off your first box and 20% off your next month of orders. All right, that's going to be it for this one. Thanks for watching. And as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.